Welcome back. You are listening to Nathy Hate on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel if you have not already. And with that, I'd like to welcome in my co-host, Modern Vintage Gamer. What's going on, Nate? It's great to be here. How, how are you doing today? I am doing well and very excited to get into this week's topic of conversation. As Nintendo has been quite vocal lately with their latest earnings report, where they kind of said a lot about upcoming hardware without saying much of anything at all, which is a bit of an, a curious factor, but it has a lot of people talking. And we also got updated sales figures on some of Nintendo's most recent releases, including Tears of the Kingdom and Mario Wonder. And we get to break down some of those sales figures and compare them to other franchises or entries of the franchises in Nintendo's history to see how they are doing. But... Lots to go over and very excited to go over it with you today. I'm looking forward to it. I know we haven't been on for a couple of weeks, but we have a, uh, some more episodes coming up and more frequent episodes. So um, thanks for sticking with us, everyone. Yes, we've done a little bit of future planning already with the holidays coming up for a couple of episodes. So a lot on our plate in the coming weeks and a lot of content for you all to consume in a very tight window. So save some room from your Thanksgiving feast because MVG and myself are going to be fulfilling many of your needs in the coming days. <laughs> I love the way how, how you say things. You have just a, a way with words there, Nate. You know who else has a way with words? Nintendo. Nintendo's president. <laughs> he has quite the way with words, a master wordsmith, if you will. He is. And he put that very finely tuned instrument of his on full display this week when he spoke to a Japanese publication about reports regarding the Switch 2, which began to circulate over the summer. And the genesis of the conversation had to do with, ironically, the Microsoft Activision Blizzard acquisition and the FTC court case, where we had testimony from everyone's favorite of Western-based CEO, Bobby Kotick, where when asked about how Call of Duty and such could come to the Nintendo Switch platform, he was pressed on what Nintendo could be offering in terms of a next-gen device. And at the time, Bobby Kotick put out a very vague statement where in his testimony, he kind of referenced that Nintendo's next platform would be similar to the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One generation of consoles. And why it wouldn't really be all that challenging to bring a quality Call of Duty to that platform, given Activision's long-standing expertise in developing Call of Duty for that generation of consoles. Now, many look at those statements and said, okay, I guess this is a loose confirmation that Nintendo has been briefing development partners. And Furukawa came out and outright denied that those, you know, those briefings ever took place, which is definitely a curious statement given that Bobby Kotick was in court and under oath. So he's somewhat suggesting that Bobby Kotick has committed perjury. Yeah, that was a very interesting report that I had read about Furukawa and his claims that, you know, it was all, you know, not real or, you know, not factual information. I mean, what are we what are we supposed to make from this that like you said that Bobby Kotick lied under oath or Furukawa is not being truthful? Obviously, there is, you know, some responsibility as the president of Nintendo that you have to protect your brand. You have to protect your shareholders from any type of things that may happen out of your control, outside of your control. And when there are high profile individuals, CEOs, presidents, whatever, from other studios, other publishers that do make comments on your next generation of hardware that technically still does not exist. I think, you know, it's, it's really, you know, it's up to the president for Akawa to basically just, you know, just, you know, just nip it in the bud, if you will, just kill it off. Right. 
But I think the side effect of his words here is that, like you said, I mean, this was something that happened under oath, you know, in a, in a court of law. This is not just a a comment that Kotick had said to a reporter of a, of a magazine outlet. Like this is this is a little bigger, it has more weight. So I think for a car, we're just kind of dismissing it. Um, just kind of doesn't make him look very good in this particular regard. But I do totally get the sentiment. I understand why Furukawa would have, you know, would have done that. I just feel like rather than say it's all BS, maybe he should have just said, we don't have really anything to comment at this time. I think that would have probably gone over a little better. But what do you think though? I mean, do you think that Furukawa's kind of response has hurt Nintendo in any way? I mean, I don't think it has, but do you think it, it kind of makes Nintendo kind of leadership look bad in this regard? With that statement alone, I don't think it makes them look bad because I'm looking at the quote again. And as the quote says, circulating on the internet as if they were public information, but they are inaccurate. And that's the one that is directly specific to the Bobby Kotick testimony statement. Mm -hmm. And I guess the area where you could look at this and say Furukawa is being technically correct is that if Kotick were treating it as though it was public information where it was widely disseminated across third-party partners, he's saying, well, this isn't true. This wasn't public information in that sense. And even when we saw the slides from the Kotick testimony, it was, you know, redacted mm -hmm. and such. And it did feel as though the emails that Nintendo had exchanged with him may have been very brief in terms of the details that they were giving Kotick and Activision about what their plans were for a next generation successor. So it may just be a, one of those situations where Furukawa is being a wordsmith. Yeah. He's talking around it saying, what he technically what I am saying is true, but only because of the way I am framing it. Right. And like to your question of does this make Nintendo look bad? I think we have to look at the secondary quote that Furukawa came out with in regards to the Switch 2 and some of the information that came out this summer, because he also added that the reports about a prototype of the upcoming handheld console being showcased to select game developers at and I quote, an overseas event in summer 2023 are also untrue. And we know what this is referring to. This is referring to Gamescom, which took place just a couple of months ago and was kind of the birthplace of a lot of discussion regarding the Switch 2 due to some tech demos that were shown at this trade event. And when you look at his quote, he specifically says prototype right now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't recall any report coming out at that time that had ever mentioned prototype hardware being shown. Because when we discussed this back around the time of Gamescom, we had specifically mentioned that there was no switch to hardware in any form present at Gamescom. Yes. You're absolutely right. And you're right. Furukawa is wordsmithing his response, right? Uh, for that exact reason that you said. In my understanding with the Gamescom presentation, the demos, whatever you want to call it, was it was shown to a room full of developers, but there was no actual hardware in the room itself. It was all kind of beamed over a live stream or, or something like that. It was, you know, there was there was footage that was shown but there was no hardware that was shown. There was no hardware in the room. There was no prototype. So Furukawa technically is correct in, in that regard. But I also want to add that um, once again, yeah, he's protecting his brand because that's what you do, especially when you are coming up to a launch of new hardware. You certainly don't want to have all these rumors going around. You want to try to, you know, basically mitigate them and, and, and kill them off as quickly as you can. But part of me is like, why, why, again, why just say no comment? We don't have anything to kind of discuss on this topic because your, your shareholders, your investors, they're not idiots. 
You know, they, they, they know what's going on. They read the articles. They read the Bloomberg reports just like what we do. They read these outlets, you know, talking about um, the next switch, right? So why wouldn't you give them something a little more than than just a, this is untrue or, or, you know, this never happened? Right. And that's the curious thing. Because when you take this statement from Furukawa, and if you were to ask me, does this damage Nintendo in any way? I would still say no. Mm. But you're kind of begging your investors to just take your statements at blind faith. We are now nearing the eighth anniversary or the eighth birthday of the Switch. It will be entering its eighth year. And how can you possibly be saying or suggesting to your investors at this point in time that you have yet to brief third-party partners of any future hardware plans? Yes. Because we know how long it typically takes for the introduction or the briefing of new hardware to be done to partners and then how long it takes to bring that hardware to market. So even if we want to go on the limited window of one year, knowing it is typically longer from the initial briefing to launch, but even if we want to operate under that one year window, if you're Nintendo at this point, you are suggesting that you have no intentions of introducing hardware in the coming year and potentially in the first half of 2025 as well. So if I'm an investor, I'm looking at your sales. Yes, you're going to hit your target of 15 million switches sold for this coming fiscal year. An admirable amount considering the age of the platform. However, Nintendo was also very reluctant to say, we're not going to adjust our forecast either. We're not going to raise it, which means they don't have confidence that they would eclipse 15 million by a sizable percentage, nor are they going to lower it. They are confident they're going to hit their original forecast. But that would also suggest that in the coming fiscal year, so April of 2024 until March of 2025, that Nintendo is recognizing there's going to be a decrease in demand for the platform. So ideally, you would have a replacement already well into production, mm -hmm. and you would have it ready in the market because you don't want to have a decline. You want to be able to do a nice, smooth transition of success into a new success. So it feels as though this was the time for Nintendo to come out with a three line blurb. Yep. Just saying more to come. More to come. Yep. Right now, we are in our planning stages of a successor to the Nintendo Switch. We will announce more details in the coming months. Our target window is fiscal year 25 or whenever their target happens to be. And that would have been enough to give you know investors confidence that you are planning for the future and it would give consumers and you know, that enthusiast crowd mm -hmm. to say, okay, Nintendo has now officially commented that the successor is on its way. They're telling us it will launch before the conclusion of March of 2025. So we have an, let's say a 16 month window mm -hmm. and we have a general idea of what they're doing. Instead, Nintendo continues to operate in the shadows. And I don't understand why they are being this secretive about a successor because we've never seen a company be this reluctant in relaying information about what they're going to do for successor hardware as we've referenced in the past you could look at sony microsoft nintendo itself they have typically given at least 12 months from an initial announcement which is a tweet a little paragraph to give to investors and then we get a reveal a little closer to the actual launch of the product and if we want to use the nx as kind of that i guess the example it was announced in the in April of 2016. No, 2015. 2015. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and like then we got the trailer in October 2016, but yeah. Nintendo had or no, it was actually April 2016, and they had said it would launch by the conclusion of that fiscal year, so we knew it had to come out by the end of March. Then they had confirmed it would come out in March. We got the trailer in October. But we knew we had a blueprint. We had the roadmap of plans. Right now, we just operate in total darkness. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you a question about Furukawa's words where he, he said, and I quote, an overseas event in summer 2023 are also untrue. So we, we, we mentioned that he's talking about the Gamescom event. 
why do you think he was singling out the Gamescom event? Because normally when there are rumors out there about, you know, the Switch 2, I mean, 99.99% of the time, Nintendo doesn't even respond. There has been some times, you know, over the years where their investor relations uh, Twitter page has come out and said, this is untrue, you know, referring to uh, some articles that, that had come out over the years. But this one is a little curious to me that it was kind of singled out. What do you think Furukawa addressed this particular overseas event? I mean, it's definitely a good question. And I mean, I guess it would just come down to Gamescom happened immediately following the conclusion of Gamescom. Yeah. A lot of reports came out, which were suggesting that, as we mentioned, you know, tech demos were shown and tech demos of a specific nature were mentioned. So when that comes out there, Burakawa must have, you know, just feels as though that information's out there and I have to get ahead of this. We have to address it. This right. is beyond just a report of developers have been briefed because yeah. that had also happened earlier this summer where you had reports out of some UK based outlets like Video Game Chronicles, better known as VGC, where they had mentioned that developers had been briefed and they were receiving dev kits. Mm -hmm. And then just over a month later, Gamescom happens. Tech demos were shown again, not on prototype hardware and they were shown on target spec hardware and yep. in video form so that means they were recorded from a dev kit or prototype hardware and then shown on a laptop to those in attendance right but to address it the way he has is really just a baffling situation and one i cannot come to terms with because it comes back to as you were saying earlier why not just come out and give a no comment in regard to all these reports by giving the statement he did all he managed to do was add gasoline to this fire of conversation yeah he said more than maybe he had intended to because these statements carry significant weight to them i agree i mean i feel like you can't really be you know wordsmithing around with investors at this point i feel like you have to be pretty upfront and honest about things. Like we are at that point, like you said, we're eight years in. It's time to, I'm not saying you you come out and announce things, but basically saying that everything is BS and everything is inaccurate, everything is untrue is almost, it's almost disrespectful to your investors say, saying something like that. If I was an, an Nintendo investor, and just for the record, I'm not, I don't have any shares in the company or anything like that. I'd be very confused kind of reading reading that comment, knowing that, you know, the Gamescom thing, it, it's beyond it's beyond a rumor. You know, it's it's something that has been corroborated and re-corroborated. I heard stuff, you heard stuff, VGC heard. I mean, everyone has heard something happened at Gamescom with new Switch hardware that was shown, or some some let me rephrase it. There was no hardware that was shown, but there was tech demos that were shown running on target Nintendo Switch 2, uh, you know, equivalent, right? Like you said, laptop or live stream, whatever. But I mean, this is beyond, uh, you know, just a, a rumor at this point. This is, this is um, I mean, it's pretty much the worst kept secret that, that er everyone knows about, right? So I feel like Furukawa really should, but, you know, have treated his kind of response to his investors with a lot more respect than he did. Look, I think Furukawa is very, you know, he's we know that he's very um he's very safe. He he plays things safe. He doesn't move very quickly. He wants to, you know, cover his bases. I get that. You definitely as the president, like I said, you want to protect your brand. You want to be the first company to announce new hardware. You don't want it to come from anywhere else. You don't want to rely on leaks and, and things to kind of drive the narrative for you. So, you know, shutting it down, I mean, I understand. And look, to be completely honest with you, Nate, if I was the Nintendo president, I don't know if I would have done anything different. I may have would have said the same thing, um, to be honest with you. But I just <laughs> I just feel like, you know, you maybe he should have just, you know, been more respectful to his investors, especially the ones that are wondering what is happening next year, Nintendo. I mean, right now we know that you have some more games coming out, 
and you're committing the switch to 2024 and beyond, that's great. But what is your long-term strategy here? What is your plans for 2024 and beyond? I feel like they really need to know these answers, but I guess, you know, we'll we'll hear about those in due course, probably at some point early next year or, you know, Q1 next year, maybe we'll hear mm-hmm. about it. See, what's interesting is how you brought up Furukawa's approach to things. How he's very conservative, very, you know, as very I said, safe. slow, yep. very safe, not an overly proactive individual in a business sense. And when we look back at prior Nintendo presidents, and we don't have to look that far back, we only have to go back, let's say, We'll go back 18 years, 15 years or so, when rumors began to circulate regarding a new platform for Nintendo with a dual screen. Mm -hmm. Nintendo had initially denied these, and then they came out with a press (laughs) type of paragraph where they came out and said, yes, there's something called a Nintendo DS. We're going to showcase it at E3 in just a few months. Please stay tuned for additional details. They saw the leaks beginning to circulate. And they just acknowledge it as, yeah, these are true. We will give a full-on reveal in the near future. Right. This feels as though the perfect opportunity for him to come out and, again, put out that short statement of work on our next generation successor to the Nintendo Switch is underway. We We will release official details in the near future. Right now, our current plan is to release it in... March of 2025, holiday 2024, summer 2024, whenever, just give a very loose target window. Mm -hmm. And do you kind of cover all of those bases? You've given enough information to confirm future plans. You have now satisfied the concerns of the investor base. You've given the enthusiast crowd confirmation that something is coming within the next 12 to 14 months. And that would be enough. This was that opportunity and for him just to, again, put his foot down and try to make a pivot with his wordsmithing Mm -hmm. of don't look there. Look at me. Nothing's happening. I promise you nothing's happening. Those reports out of Gamescom that we had given any type of tech demo on prototype hardware, that is untrue. And yeah, his statement is technically true because again, there was no prototype hardware. It feels as though Nintendo overthought the situation where they really had an easy layup here of just give a general confirmation with no details and you can go on business as usual yes because it's not going to affect their bottom line this fiscal year you're still going to get substantial sales you're going to see huge sales this holiday with all the bundles you have crafted you're going to hit 15 million by the end of march 2024 and then you can begin to forecast new things yeah, t- totally right. I mean, could have could have definitely handled it better than than what he did. And look, Furukawa has been has been awesome for Nintendo. I mean, he's he's proven himself as a a great president. You know, he's basically seen the the Switch generation. But I I am curious about what the transition will look like. How he will handle the transition. And some of the things that we're we're seeing here, where he's basically just shutting down all these rumors and and shutting down all this talk about Switch Two, does play into that. So I think you know Furukawa's biggest test, Nate, to be honest, is I mean he's done very very well, but he didn't um, start with the Switch hardware. He he kind of came into it right. So this is really going to be I feel like his biggest test. How how he manages the transition from the current switch to the next generation model. And it seems like, you know, he wants to, he wants complete control of the narrative, which again, I completely understand as the president, you want, you know, it it starts and ends with you type of thing. So I understand that, but also, you know, I I don't want to kind of go around in circles in, in this conversation, but I just feel like he could have handled his words better to his mm-hmm. investors, especially when we're, we're seven years in or eight years in to, to the Switch. I think it, it could have been handled a lot better. And one thing I do want to end on before we move away from the denial and the Gamescom topic is that I want to address the timing of when could Nintendo potentially reveal this platform. Because as you'll recall, back when we discussed Game Gamescom in 
we posted in a September episode or mm-hmm. late August. It was the idea that the window of March was a very persistent mention at Gamescom regarding this particular piece of hardware from Nintendo. And there was a lot of uncertainty as to what March meant with the Nintendo investors briefing having now come and gone and Nintendo not giving any official confirmation or intent of having a next gen successor to the switch in the planning. I am now of the belief that the March mention at Gamescom, if it does actually mean something, is the window of reveal. That is when Nintendo is going to make an announcement regarding new hardware from them because it would be basically at their conclusion of their fiscal year. So it's kind of that opportune time to come out and say, we've hit our 15 million. We are planning new hardware to release in the new fiscal year. And we are targeting so-and-so month or window. Because otherwise, I just cannot come to any comprehension as to what March may have been referring to. Because it feels as though March, in terms of a release date, has now come and gone. And the only thing March would fit is a reveal or an announcement. I totally agree with that. I mean, it's just too soon. It just doesn't make any logical sense that, that there would be a new system out in March. I think you're right. I think basically... The marketing machine kind of starts in March with an announcement and then and it kind of goes from there as as to when we would see the, the hardware. I mean, I couldn't say, but obviously later on in 2024 would probably sound about right to me. But yeah, I mean, yeah, it seems like, you know, this March thing, this potential for a March release, I mean, we're midway through November now. Furukawa has doubled down on you know his his feelings about switch two rumors and stuff i don't really see anything happening until kind of later in 2024 yeah i mean that's he kind of gave a lot in that very brief statement for what we could take away from yeah simply due to the amount of information that is out there that was circulated at gamescom regardless of his denial And again, it comes down to that wordsmithing of, yes, prototypes weren't there. You are technically correct, but there was a lot of conversation. Things were shown. So he kind of let on more about the successor hardware than maybe originally intended with his comments. But other information did come out from the investors briefing as Nintendo put out a new slide, which seemingly has given hope that backwards compatibility will in fact be a core feature of the Switch 2 whenever the platform is introduced, as Nintendo changed the verbiage of one of their slides regarding the relationships with consumers. And Nintendo specifically talks about their Nintendo account system and how it is now possible for them to connect with the user more directly and how the user's history of their personal account is kind of the foundation that Nintendo is going to build upon where Nintendo can maintain a lasting relationship with their consumers and how, you know, you can now maintain users' information across platform generations, including details such as their software purchases and gameplay records. Mm -hmm. Now, that is a change from what Nintendo had previously had up on a slide of a similar take And this has given hope that backwards compatibility is going to be featured on the Switch 2, as that mention specifically of software purchases. And I'm not going to take this as a hard confirmation that that backwards compatibility has now been confirmed, but it does seem as though it is a more, maybe a bigger priority to Nintendo to make a reality as they do recognize that Digital purchases are something that do have to transfer with the user into new generations of hardware. So this definitely can give individuals a glimmer of hope that there will indeed be backwards compatibility moving forward. Yeah, I've looked at this uh, slide deck and tried to analyze it and try to make sense of, of potentially whether it gives more hope to backward compatibility and I haven't really come up with anything to make me feel stronger uh, one way or the other. I mean, there is definitely, you know, words and, and information here that does 
imply, and I want to stress the word imply, that digital purchases on the Switch will carry forward to the new hardware. And that could well be the case, Nate. But, um, you know, is that, are we talking about backward compatibility at that point? Are we just basically talking about, you know, software updates, patches, you know, um, updating, updating legacy titles to support new hardware? I mean, the definition of backward compatibility for me is I take a game cartridge from an old generation and I put it into the current generation and it should work with some level of, you know, backward compatibility emulation. And this doesn't really answer that question. What it does tell me though, is that it seems like, you know, things like, uh, you know, it's digital purchases, potentially NSO, things like that will carry forward. If you have a Nintendo account and you have a subscription, all that stuff will come forward, but it doesn't really tell us anything more about legacy games running on new hardware. At this point, it seems like there is maybe more of a, um, I guess, uh, a, a, a lead into that, that potentially that's what they're saying without actually saying it. But unfortunately, we still don't really have enough here to kind of confirm that backward compatibility is going to be a, a thing. But, and we've talked about this before, I want to be very clear that just because I'm saying no backward compatibility, that doesn't mean that Nintendo isn't doesn't have a way to bring their old games to new hardware. And what I mean by that is, you know, like I said, software updates, patches, um, enhancements, you know, things like that, that basically retarget the new, the new system. But we'll see. I mean, this is definitely a little more hopeful than the previous slide that they sh had shown us. But I feel like rather than focus on backward compatibility with this slide deck, or this particular slide, I should say, I think that the main focus here is Nintendo account. Like the, I think, you know, Nintendo has been uh -huh. obviously criticized and they've, they've changed their, their online account system over the years, different generations, they've done different things. And I think they're really just, you know, letting everyone know that, Hey, this is going to be it, you know, for the long term. this is how things are going to happen. And, um, you know, does that mean day one you're going to be able to play your entire Switch library on new hardware? I can't answer that. I mean, there's a good possibility that it may or may not, right? But maybe what we're what we're supposed to take away from this is that Nintendo, with the Nintendo account, and you know the fact that you they do kind of manage your save data and your purchase history, will make your library available to you uh, at some point in the future. And hopefully that's that's the case here. Yeah, the Nintendo Switch account system or Nintendo account system in general has been a huge step up from what Nintendo had previously offered on the Wii DS, even 3DS generation, where we had to continue to start brand new, which is why we had to purchase our virtual console games again on the Wii U, or you had to pay an upgrade fee if you wanted to play it natively on the Wii U. You could always do that transfer with the SD card where you would play it in Wii mode via pure backwards compatibility. And it was definitely one of those points of contention for Nintendo where people were saying, why doesn't my account simply transfer over, especially when Microsoft and Sony had a well-founded account system that just continued to move forward with you. And even with Sony from the PlayStation 3 and the advent of the PSN ID system, mm -hmm. even though you didn't have access to those backward or those games, Fire backwards compatibility on the PlayStation 4, when PS1 games and PSP games came to PlayStation 5 via the PlayStation Plus Essentials Extra High End Tier, if you had already purchased those PlayStation 1 games, you immediately got free access. So the account system recognized those per that purchase history for those games, which was an incredible surprise for a lot of people. So when you look at this specific slide, I'm not saying Nintendo is that forward thinking just in the situation that the Switch 2 somehow is not backwards compatible, that if one day the Switch 3 is backwards compatible with Switch 1 games, that it would recognize your digital purchase history. But that could also be a case here. Yeah. And to go on the backwards compatibility route just a little more, 
Right now, there is still no clarity in terms of official communication regarding backwards compatibility. Partners are still operating in a very gray area where some are saying, yes, it is there. Others are still saying, no, it's not. And it seems as though Nintendo isn't giving really crystal clear briefing on that, that particular matter to partners either. So that's where there's just a continuous uncertainty as to what is happening with backwards compatibility. And as has been said in the past, there is a little movement in the firmware for these dev kits where there is a backwards compatibility layer that is present. Mm -hmm. The issue is no one really knows what it does. So we're just left in the dark. It seems as though we are making progress towards backwards compatibility being a thing for Switch 2. We just don't have any official confirmation from Nintendo briefings with partners that it will in fact be there. Yeah. And I think we won't really know until, um, you know, the announcement is made. And honestly, even when the Switch is announced, we may not hear about backward compatibility, and, you know, after the fact. It, I think it's I think it's something that, honestly, Nate, uh, I, again, I don't know, uh, you know, what, what Nintendo is doing with this, but I feel like backward compatibility is, is definitely something that, they are very much aware of being a key factor for new hardware. We've talked about it on the show previously that we feel like backward compatibility has to be in there for the new system to be successful. But I think it's going to be an evolving kind of conversation that potentially, you know, when we get an announcement of new hardware, potentially they may not even acknowledge that at that time. It may be something that comes later on. So we're just going to have to wait and see how that all plays out. But look, I am hopeful that there will be some level of backward compatibility in the new hardware. I do think that the Nintendo account slide is really reassuring their customers that look, you know, we 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 know what you've purchased, we know and we have all your save data. We we understand um, how important this is for you to kind of carry your account across generations. And I think that's really all, all, we're, all they're talking about at this point. But we'll have to see what happens with, with the BC stuff. Now, Nintendo did put out another curious slide, and it was about their future outlook. And one of the lines definitely stood out. It's where they mention, and I quote, We will continue to release new titles and content for Nintendo Switch without being bound by the traditional concept of the platform life cycle. <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you think that means? Because I have, I have uh, my ideas on that. What do you think that means? How do you translate that? My translation is we're going to release games on the Switch and new hardware at the same time, kind of a cross-gen window because I just can't envision anything else that that would translate to, but I am curious as to how you take it. I take it the same way, but I also take it as more along the lines of the Switch isn't going to go away anytime soon. It could be 2029 and we're still accepting no, submissions say for that. Switch games. Don't say that. I think that's what, what they're saying. I'm not saying, you know, that's what's going to happen, but... They're probably going to keep the Switch around for a while yet. And you're right. There is going to be cross-platform games, right? I um, mean, I think they've seen like the success of PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5, right? Like when the PlayStation 5 launched, you know, the first year, 18 months, two years, a lot of people were still buying PS4 titles. And they are still buying PS4 titles, even though I think Sony now has officially sunset any first party ps4 games you know i think there's there's definitely a window where there will be cross-generation games and i think that window may be open up maybe a little longer than we think because normally when there's a new system that comes out maybe and i'm just being generous maybe there's like an 18 month window of time maybe two years where you know the the old system continues to be supported but eventually it kind of falls away but I think what what I'm getting from this is Nintendo, obviously the Switch is still selling well. Games are still selling very well. I don't think they're done. You know, I think what they're saying here is we're going to continue to work on Switch games 
first party games even and it they, it may be around for a little while yet so you know we're not we're not going away just just yet yeah and given the lineup nintendo has already positioned for 2024 with super princess peach luigi's mansion 2 remake and such it does feel as though nintendo is going to continue to support the switch for a meaningful amount of time i mean there are still games coming to switch that have not been announced yet right we're still like waiting for the Metroid. fire emblem genealogy of the holy war remake and metroid prime 4 so yeah nintendo is definitely going to treat the switch as a priority in terms of a platform for software releases even after the introduction of a successor and the playstation 5 to the playstation 4 is a fantastic point because sony had committed the last really three years or so to mm -hmm. supporting that platform the last first party game that was cross-gen for them would have been god of war ragnarok correct yeah yeah uh, about a year ago yeah i mean that is a long-term commitment they promised they would do it and now they are beginning to make that pivot to playstation 5 only releases from their internal studios and depending on when games enter the pipeline for the switch it is definitely in nintendo's benefit to continue to cater to this massive user base that they have built since 2017. Now, and let me ask you a question. So mm -hmm. after after Breath of the Wild released on the Wii U, were there any other Wii U games that actually launched? I know there was no first party Wii U games, but I know there were the occasional, um, you know, these were kind of one-off, you know, smaller like indie studio type Wii U games, but I mean, how much longer was the Wii U supported? And I know that's not a great comparison because oh. the Wii U was was pretty much dead on arrival, but they right. pretty much killed it off. I mean, once the Switch came out, the Wii U was, you know, it was very quickly in the rearview mirror, I feel like. Yeah, I don't think anything of note, unless you want to consider Just Dance a release of note, right? which continued to come to even the Wii, I think, <laughs> throughout the entirety of the Wii U generation. It did. So... Um, <laughs> So I think I would look to like the PS2 or maybe the 3DS as yeah. better examples. Yeah, but yeah, given yeah. given we're talking about Nintendo, I guess the 3DS would be the better example there. And the 3DS did receive a number of high profile, at least I would, you know, classify them as high profile releases after the introduction of the Switch, one of them being Metroid Samus Returns. And you also had a Fire Emblem game you had the luigi's mansion you had mario and luigi come and these titles didn't exactly fare well when it came to sales due to a large portion of the nintendo base really just being over the 3ds and wanting to get that upgrade and going to a switch so that in retrospect i wouldn't be surprised if nintendo might look at that and say we don't want to replicate the mistakes we made there but right. given that the switch is still a fairly capable piece of hardware even when you introduce something that will be leaps and bounds you know far better than what the switch can do visually in a fidelity sense i think there would still be a sizable percentage because the switch is more has more of a casual audience to it than the 3ds likely had so when you're bringing out some of these cross-generational games let's use metroid prime 4 as an example there are going to be individuals who will gladly just play Metroid Prime 4 on their Switch versus investing and in buying a Switch 2 for, let's say, $400, $450 just to have better visuals alone. Because we can look at the PlayStation. A lot of people were still buying Miles Morales, God of War Ragnarok, Horizon Forbidden West on their PlayStation 4. Oh, yeah. Because you had the hardware, yep. the games looked and ran well enough that you didn't feel as though you had to go out and invest. $500 just to play these games. So I think Nintendo, they're going to do a very similar approach here with a select amount of games. It all comes down again to what is in the pipeline. If these games had started development, let's say around 2020, right, be, right around the time COVID hit and put a large kind of stall in development. Now those games are getting ready for market in 2024, yeah. maybe even 2025. And I think Nintendo would say, let's continue them, bring them to the current Switch as planned. And if we can do a cross-generational release with the successor, we will. Mm -hmm. And we can enhance them, we can make them better. So those who have the better hardware 
have that option. And those who still have the Switch and are happy with the current Switch will feel as though they are continually getting supported. They're still getting value from their purchase. And we can move forward because as Nintendo, it's a win. You don't care where people are playing your game. You just want people to buy the game right. and give you money. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think th- I think that absolutely makes sense. And, you know, it's going to be two systems for a while. And there's going to be some overlap. There's going to be some cross-gen games. There may be some games that only come out for the Switch. There may be some games that only come out for the next gen and not on the Switch. We don't really know what, what those rules are yet. I mean, um, you know, having having a cross-gen type approach really means that you know, there's going to be a lot of overlap with, you know, the the life cycle of both both systems. But I think Nintendo's all all they're really saying here is, you know, we don't want to be tied down by kind of traditional um, you know, end of life cycle type approaches where once a new system comes out you know we we kind of forget about the old one and just kind of move on i think the switch is going to be around for a while yet um you know it could be 10 years you know it could be a 10 year plan for for the switch that could very easily happen and and yeah i mean if they are still making first party games on the switch i think there's really no reason why they couldn't release them for both systems as long as the switch is still capable of playing these games i think eventually over time you know the new system will pull away in terms of uh you know the scope of the games the the size the performance you know the um the things that they bring to the table that the current model just is not capable of of doing but until that time comes and and look yeah it could be 2 3 years uh into the new generation when finally it's time to say look the switch isn't really uh you know cutting it anymore it's not selling anymore no one's really buying anything anymore so maybe it's time to you know to sunset the system but until that point i think you know the switch is going to be around yeah they're just basically saying we're not going to do a clean break from the generation to a new generation we're going to continue to support it for as long as we deem viable and then we will gradually pivot to a next gen i think it's a way to communicate to investors that we're selling a lot of software right now we have a lot of evergreen titles and we continue to anticipate that in our forecast that we're going to have evergreen titles for the next couple of years for whatever we bring to the Switch platform, even after the introduction of brand new hardware that we hope to continue to really benefit from those evergreen titles and that we believe we can just sell outside of that traditional console period, which now really, I'm not really sure what the definition of a traditional console period would constitute today because it has evolved over the years when you and i were younger Mm -hmm. a typical cycle was around five years that has now gone to seven in some cases nine years so i don't know what a traditional console cycle is i guess anywhere between six to eight yeah six to eight i think is about yeah we're definitely in that twilight of the switch in terms of its lifespan and nintendo still sees means of being able to make a healthy profit on the platform and they're going to continue to do so with software that can complement both systems moving forward and i want to go into the hardware that nintendo reported as right now the nintendo switch stands at 132 million and 46 units so that is a nice number it's by far their most successful home console still well shy of the nintendo ds Mm -hmm. i want to pose the question to you as we have to do every time nintendo updates their hardware figures (laughs) will nintendo surpass the playstation 2 or the nintendo ds i've always said they will not pass the playstation 2 i think the playstation 2 is out of reach there's just no way in my view that it will get there the ds Potentially, I mean, it it could well uh, get there, but uh, hardware sales have definitely slowed up. I mean, let's let's be honest. But I think you know, this year has been a good year. Next year, there is some some games that are still coming out. I think it could pass the DS, but I think the PlayStation Two is just out of reach. What do you think? Well, to get to the DS, it has to sell about 21.7 million units Mm -hmm. 
from where it currently is. And with Nintendo's forecast for the remainder of the year, they have to sell just over 8 million units to hit the 15 million figure, which would bring them, for the sake of discussion, at an even 140 million units, bringing it 14 million units behind the DS and roughly in the area of, depending on what PlayStation 2 figure you want to take, anywhere from, what, 18 million to 20 million yeah. behind the PlayStation 2. Let's say so, let's say 18 million. Let's go to the okay. low end. The low end of it. Yeah. So 18 million for the PlayStation 2. Now come the next fiscal year, recognizing that 15 million was the exact forecast per Nintendo's words that they were to make for this year, you would have to anticipate that there would be a downturn in terms of Switch forecast for the coming fiscal year of 2024 into 25. So even if they do a reasonable decrease of, let's just say, 20% for year over year, they would then come in at about 12 million for that forecast, which would still be shy of the DS and the PlayStation 2. But it would definitely make the DS a, a possibility for the following fiscal year. So it, I think the PlayStation 2 and the DS being surpassed by the Switch really comes down to how long is Nintendo going to manufacture the Switch? Right. If they cut it off following the coming fiscal year, so if they don't produce any units going into tw- you know 2026 i think it falls short it's going to come exceptionally close it will likely climb into that low 150s maybe even past the ds by a million mm-hmm. or so but i think the playstation 2 is going to remain out of reach yeah simply because i don't know if nintendo is going to manufacture enough systems if they manufacture the system for the next three years right i mean we're talking going into late 2026 early 2027 then it may pass the playstation 2 yeah but that is the only way i see it happening so right now it is still kind of that toss-up in my head i say it's not going to happen in my heart i have to say it's possible right my gut says hey it's all to whether or not nintendo want to keep making these systems and you it's hard to predict what Nintendo is going to do with that production line. If they begin to completely fade out the Switch Lite or the Switch OG and they purely focus on the OLED, that figure for the next fiscal year could be lower than 12 million. They could come in at 10 million, maybe 8 million, mm-hmm. which seems a bit harsh. That's a very sharp decline year over year, but it really comes down to what Nintendo comes out with next year for their fiscal forecast and then i think we would be in a better position to determine whether or not the ds and the playstation 2 will be dethroned by the switch but as it stands it does feel as though those platforms are just a bit out of reach but we can revisit this in you know five to six months to see if we feel a little a little differently once nintendo gives us better guidance into what they're anticipating in their coming fiscal year yep agree but we did have another big sales update and that goes to tears of the kingdom we previously saw their sales figures at the end of june saying they had shipped 18.5 million copies of tears of the kingdom in just over a month an absolute colossal launch for the game many then began to have that conversation of will it pass tears of the kingdom We had that conversation prior to the game's launch, and we both said it will not happen on the Switch specifically. We were only talking about the Switch. We weren't talking about any next-gen re-releases or anything like that. With this sales update, do you want to revise your previous prediction, or do you remain confident? No, I remain remain more confident now than I did previously. I, I was a little unsure about where tears of the kingdom would end up last time we talked i i did feel strongly that it wouldn't outsell tears of the kingdom and simply because you know it's it's the whole sequel thing you know like the sequels to games usually don't sell very well uh, uh, let me let me rephrase it sequels to games don't sell as well as the original we we did a whole episode on this we basically looked at the history of Zelda games on various systems. And we concluded that 
the sequels just don't sell as well as you know the first game breath of the wild was a once in a generation game it's an absolute masterpiece tears of the kingdom is an iteration of the exact same engine the the exact same game and they've added so many amazing things to that game some new mechanics and some really great gameplay enhancements all around but breath of the wild it's it's like a one trick pony man you can only really do it once and you know you really can't recapture that amount of sales i feel like again now with that said tears of the kingdom is still a fantastic game it's selling exceptionally well i do think it's going to come close kind of like the the ps2 discussion previously but it's not going to overtake breath of the wild uh you can you can you know, um, we can have the switch go on for another three years beyond, you know, this eight year. And I still feel like it won't get there because Breath of the Wild just continues to sell. And I might add, it, it's got a price cut, right? Like I think over the, this holiday season, I think they've they've dropped the price of the game. Is that right? I I saw some I sales believe, for it. I believe it's one of their holiday sales yeah. where it's thirty nine ninety nine. So. I just feel like Nintendo, um, I think they know that Tears of the Kingdom, while it will uh, sell very well, it is selling very well. Let, let's be very clear, 18.5 million. I mean, come on, that is that is phenomenal, especially in the time. But there's something about Tears of the Kingdom for me where I just feel like it's just fallen off a lot sharper than maybe some people have anticipated. I think Tears of the Kingdom is is a fantastic game. One of my favorite games of this year, definitely in the conversation for game of the year. But like I said, you really just can't pull off the same trick twice and have people, you know, show up in the same numbers that they did with Breath of the Wild. But we'll see. I, I, I'm sticking to my guns. I think it's not going to outsell Breath of the Wild. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. What, what do you think? I mean, are you revising your, uh, you know, your your kind of opinions on this at all? No, it will still fall short of outselling Breath of the Wild on the Switch. Yes. And the main thing is, is Breath of the Wild continues to sell. As you mentioned, the game is nearing 32 million sales in its own right. And with Tears of the Kingdom currently sitting at 19.5 million units shipped, with sell through, I believe, in the area of 17 and a half million, still an admirable amount of number, you know, figures for sales. The thing is, is that when it launched and those initial figures came out, everyone said, look how, look how quick it is selling. Mm -hmm. This is easily going to eclipse Breath of the Wild because Breath of the Wild in its first six months had sold in the area of, I believe, four and a half million copies. But that isn't a fair comparison because Breath of the Wild has grown with the Switch user base. Right. Something that Tears of the Kingdom has in, to its advantage is that it can now sell to that established base that Breath of the Wild helped build. Yeah. So when you have those record-breaking, huge launch numbers, you can't also have record-breaking great legs as well mm -hmm. because you're eventually hitting market saturation and as we discussed way back in may there was always that point of what percentage of zelda fans that have bought breath of the wild played it despised it mm -hmm. and had no interest in tears of the kingdom that was there going to be a significant enough base of new interest to offset that base that has moved on. And right now, it seems as though the initial sales, which are, again, exceptionally strong, is still catering to that Zelda audience that Breath of the Wild had brought in. And when you look at a lot of the online conversation around Tears of the Kingdom, it's not as prominent as Breath of the Wild was. As you were mentioning, Breath of the Wild was truly revolutionary for its time. Tears of the Kingdom refined the experience a lot, but Tears of the Kingdom doesn't feel as though it has the staying power or the word of mouth that Breath of the Wild had because Breath of the Wild was new. Tears of the Kingdom, it's the Hyrule you have come to know through Breath of the Wild. Yeah. Once you finish the game, there's really not 
much to go off and explore. Like you can explore, but it has a very much a been there, done that feel to it. Whereas Breath of the Wild, it was what's around this corner? Ooh, what's this? What's this? Yeah. You wanted to explore every inch of Hyrule because you didn't know what it may have. Now with Tears of the Kingdom, it was, well, I know it's there. Yeah. Even if there's something new there, you kind of lost that luster. And that could be a contributing factor to the sales a little bit. It's going to be interesting to see where the two land come post holiday, because as you mentioned, Breath of the Wild being discounted, it's going to continue to sell very strong this holiday season. And depending on how Tears of the Kingdom does, even if Tears of the Kingdom moves, let's say three, three million units this holiday, if Breath of the Wild moves one and a half million units, yep, it only made up just over a million units on Breath of the Wild and overall sales. Mm -hmm. So that would mean it will take many, many quarters, yeah. many years to catch up to the sales that Breath of the Wild has established. Now, when things finally settle and the Switch generation is done and the successor is out, we can revisit the sales. And I think Tears of the Kingdom will end up in that high 20, maybe low 30 figure. It's just going to be that Breath of the Wild will then be entering the mid 30 sales range. It's just not going to catch up to it. But both record breaking legendary numbers that any game would aspire to reach and that can stand as a testament to just nintendo's strength this generation but when the dust settles i think breath of the wild will remain the yep. pinnacle of zelda sales yeah absolutely i think you know there's just really no way around it you know like like part of me wonders should should they have held back Breath of uh, Tears of the Kingdom for the next generation as a launch title. And, you know, there were some rumors about that. Remember, like maybe a year ago, people were, you know, rumor, there was rumors about oh, it's, it's launching with the next Switch, whatever. But I don't, I'm not even sure if that would have, would have helped either. I think the only real way that you can bring out a Zelda game that is going to perform better than Breath of the Wild is to make an entirely new Zelda game with an entirely new concept. Yes, you have to do something that's going to excite the base. Because even when I look at the chart here, 25% of Breath of the Wild sales came within the first 12 months. Which, when you think think of that now, 75% mm -hmm. of sales came after the first year. Tears of the Kingdom is just not going to have that advantage because, again, the user base is now established. It's already there. Those interested in Tears of the Kingdom have access to the game at day one. Those interested in Breath of the Wild had to buy the Switch to get it. And those interested in that game grew interest year over year as that install base continued to grow. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think Tears of the Kingdom is the Zelda game Nintendo wanted to make from the beginning or the Breath of the Wild game they wanted to make. I just, you know, obviously they didn't have the time. And look, Tears of the Kingdom is a fine game. It's, a, it's one of my, like I said, one of my favorite games of, of this year. But... I just personally, I just can't see it outselling Breath of the Wild, and I think we we called it correctly. And again, let's let's revisit this again when there's new sales figures that come out. But I wouldn't expect really it, it things to change. I think history has told us that the sequels just don't sell as well as the original games, and that's just the way things are. You know, with with when it comes to uh, Legend of Zelda. We did get one other update, and it's on Super Mario Wonder. We got the initial two-week sales figures, and it comes in at 4.3 million sales. And that seems very strong leading into the holiday season. I would not be surprised if Nintendo announces come the end of 2023 that Mario Wonder is in the area of 12 to 15 million sales come the holiday conclusion. Do you think it'll be in that range or you think it might come in a little lower? I, I think it'll be in that range. It, it's it's good enough. It's a it's a fantastic game. It is uh, something that I think is going to attract a lot of buyers. Yeah, I mean, look, it's Mario, it's 2D, it's it's a it's a it's just an amazing game. And and I think it'll definitely get there. I I'm not worried about Mario Wonder selling and and continuing to sell. I think it's just gonna be one of those you know, typical evergreen Nintendo Mario titles that just keeps going and going and going. So 
very, very, very good start. And I think it's just going to continue. Now, there are a few other standouts from Nintendo's earning report, like Advance Wars has not sold or shipped a million copies, which is, is a shame. That is a shame. I, I think, I don't know. I mean, do you think it's it's delay uh, hurt that in any way? I kind of feel like maybe it did. Because uh, you remember the game was delayed indefinitely for a while. For a long while, actually. We oh. didn't know what was going on with it. Mm-hmm. And then it kind of came out. Uh, and it's a great game, but I am a little surprised that it didn't sell as much as it did. But I do feel like, I don't know, people, I just felt like people were kind of tired of waiting uh, around to hear something about the game. Maybe there were some rumors that the game had was never going to come out or maybe it was shelved. But I don't know, like, and there wasn't really much in terms of marketing around the game when it did finally appear. I'm not saying Nintendo going to set, set it up to fail. But I am surprised that it didn't sell more than it did. Your thoughts? It's, I think the wait definitely hurt it, where it was one of those situations of, I can't wait to buy the game, then it was indefinitely delayed. And then when it finally came out, it was just kind of like, eh, I'm kind of over you. I lost my interest. Yeah. Other games have come that I would rather purchase, especially when you look at when they slotted the game in this year. It was right before Tears of the Kingdom. Definitely. If you yeah. have a budget for when you're buying a game, you are going to allocate your $60, $70 to Tears of the Kingdom over Advance Wars. And Advance Wars just isn't that popular of a franchise, which is why it took so long to see any form of a revival. Um, In better news, everybody's 1-2 Switch also didn't sell 1 million (laughs) copies. So we can all applaud that. And MC Horus finally got taken out back and was beheaded and put into the bed of... Yep, so they did take him out back. Good job, Nintendo. Yes, that horse has neighed no more. <laughs> Took him to the glue factory. <laughs> um, we didn't get any sales updates for titles like Metroid Prime Remaster. We can just hope it is still selling very well as it is one of Nintendo's greatest games of all time. And oh, yeah. it is a fantastic translation over to the switch with in in my top five best games of the year love it absolutely fantastic game and that concludes the sales talk for this episode we're now going to go into some of the Streamlabs questions for this week and our first one comes from jackie g who donated a dollar and writes what are your predictions for playstation's lineup in 2024 Ooh. ah I couldn't tell you. I honestly I couldn't tell you what what my predictions are. I think my predictions are a big bunch of nothing is is what I'm predicting for PlayStation <laughs> next year because it's currently November, the middle of November, and we have zero visibility as to what is going on with Sony next year. I think Sony I hate to say it but and you know maybe this is a, a another episode where we deep dive into Sony going into next year when we kind of review review the year that we've had. I think Sony is probably feeling a little bit nervous uh, as to what they have in store for us next year. Yeah, right now it's really hard to say what Sony will have in 2024. If we want to look at the showcase from June as an indicator of what they may have in 2024. We certainly don't have a lot to go off. I think the only game that had officially been dated for 2024 that Sony has any assistance in, in terms of a publishing deal, so not internally at Sony, would be Team Ninja's Rise of the Ronin. What about Rebirth? Yeah, I mean, I guess you would count Rebirth as it is a platform exclusive, Mm -hmm. so you would count that. I think third parties may do a lot of heavy lifting in 2024 for the PlayStation 5, very similar to what we saw in 2023, but maybe more refined with more variety because you'll have titles, as mentioned, Rebirth, Silent Hill 2, things along that nature. We know Helldivers 2 is coming out in 2024 from Sony. We know we'll have MLB The Show. There's definitely a lot of question marks as to what else Sony could have that year. Will Wolverine make 2024? Will Death Stranding 2 
what are some of the unannounced games Sony may have planned for 2024? Could we finally see Sucker Punch show up with Ghost of Tsushima 2? I don't think we're going to see any something? of those games next year. I don't think we're going to see Death Stranding 2. <laughs> no, seriously, I don't think we're going to see it. Ne- I don't think Wolverine we're going to see next year. We may see um, a teaser or a, a trailer, but I don't think there's a release for either of those games in 2024. Yeah, I mean, right now it's really tough. This would definitely be a topic that we visit in the early portion of next year when we give some of our thoughts and predictions on what Sony will have in store for us in 2024. But as we as 2023 comes to a conclusion and with Sony really being quiet about their future plans, it's really hard to gauge what's going it's going to be looking like come next year. I mean, I don't want to say it's going to be barren, but you could potentially be seeing a very similar type of output as what we saw in 2023 from Sony's internal studios. But maybe the Game Awards will surprise us. Maybe Death Stranding 2 will get a brand new trailer with a release target at the Game Awards. And then we have a little more insight into what Sony has planned for next year. But as it stands at this moment, based purely on official communication via Sony and their partners, I think it's going to be a third-party exclusive heavy year. Agree. Then had a dollar donation from Design. After taking careful consideration of every game that released this year, I was able to pinpoint the six Game of the Year nominees. Baldur's Gate 3, Cocoon, Resident Evil 4, Spider-Man 2, Super Mario Bros. Wonder, The Legend of Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom. What do you guys think? I mean, that's a pretty good list. I personally don't see cocoon in that list because i don't feel like there's room for the indie game this year there's just so many good triple a titles that have released all i can really say is there's going to be some upsets there's going to be some unhappy people there's going to be some snubs we'll just have to wait and see but it's a pretty good list i I think the only thing i would probably do is swap out cocoon personally and put starfield in there the one thing missing from the list that I'm not sure what title I would take out, maybe I would take out Resident Evil 4 from that list and I would replace it with Alan Wake 2. But so, I love the Cocoon representation. I haven't played Alan Wake, but I will play it uh, before the Game Awards comes and goes. So uh, yeah, I'll have to, you know, if I feel like it's it's worth, you know, getting in there, I've obviously heard a lot of good things. But yeah, I mean, otherwise I'm pretty happy with that list. Yeah, I think we're going to see a very similar list when the Game Awards are announced in just a few days. We then had a dollar donation from Blue Ink Blot. Did the Mario Kart Tour and Booster Pass DLC take up all that development team's resources, or do you think they have been working on a brand new Mario Kart in parallel? Do we expect to see a new Mario Kart come out within one year of the Switch 2 launch? I do anticipate that we will see a new Mario Kart come out within one year of the Switch 2 launch. I don't believe the entire development team has been working on the Booster Pass DLC and Mario Kart Tour. I believe they have been prototyping and such a brand new Mario Kart game, and they will have a brand new one out within that. I will say the launch window of the Switch 2, whenever that may be. They simply made that pivot to doing the Booster Pass DLC because Mario Kart 8 Deluxe kept selling and Nintendo saw a market to sell new content to and increase their revenue and profits as much as they could. But yeah, the development team definitely working on something else in parallel to those other projects. Yep. Then had a $5 donation from That Thing You Dan. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> about on. two skews and bc what if there's a digital and a deluxe deluxe has a cart slot and hardware backwards compatibility a tegra x1 question mark more money but plays all switch one games digital is cheaper but only has backwards compatibility for games that developers patch including big first party games we, we sort of touched on this in a previous episode where there was some discussion potentially about a two skew approach to the new system. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, that could possibly happen, but I don't really think it will personally. I think 
Nintendo's not going to, um, you know, carry two systems, one that has kind of legacy hardware and one that doesn't. I feel like they're trying to stay razor focused on the next generation. And I think there's only going to be, I mean, I think there's only going to be one SKU, at least initially. Maybe, maybe later on something will get announced potentially, but I don't know. I mean, we have talked about this two skew thing before, Nate. What, what do you what do you think about it? I mean, if they go the two skew approach, I mean, I think it ultimately would end up just becoming a situation of if you're a digital only skew, obviously you have digital only backwards compatibility. Whereas the other SKU that would have physical media and digital options would have backwards compatibility with both mediums. I just can't see them really complicating the message yeah. where one has a specific form of backwards compatibility that the other one doesn't have. It would just be a nightmare to really market. You have to keep it as basic as you can. I think that's the approach they would do in terms of a true two SKU approach. I definitely could see them introduce that digital only skew at some point during the generation. I don't know necessarily at launch, but I do think that will be something that Nintendo considers when the generation does begin, whether it's a year or two years into the generation when it is introduced. It's hard to say, but it wouldn't surprise me for Nintendo to go that route. It's just a very viable and very profitable direction for them to take. Sony and Microsoft have already embraced that direction and they've seen great success with it. So I think it's only a matter of time before Nintendo looks to mirror that success and do it for their own hardware. I then had a $2.01 donation from Zoob Murr. All of this talk of stats, features, and performance makes me wonder, why does the PlayStation 5 get the highest performance of any gaming hardware when technically more powerful hardware exists? Does it get that reputation for being the most powerful hardware? I mean, I feel like the Series X, you know, is kind of advertised even to be the most powerful console in the world right now. Yeah, I mean, even when the PlayStation 5 may outperform it in some areas, it still comes down to implementation. It comes down to which platform was the lead on. As you can look at, I believe it's Alan Wake 2 performs better on Xbox Series X than it does on PlayStation 5, then you could easily find another game that the PlayStation 5 will outperform the Xbox Series X on. And we know there is a slight difference. I believe it is in RAM speed, uh, SSD speed and such, which could have a an impact on performance. So even though the Series X is more powerful in raw figures, the PlayStation 5 can be more efficient in other ways that could lead to performance being superior on the platform. So it really comes down to implementation. It will vary game to game. There's a lot of factors that you really have to consider when it comes to best overall thing. Because again, you could go back to the GameCube generation where the Xbox was the most powerful platform on the market. And some would say the PlayStation 2 was in second place in terms of raw power, but the GameCube handedly outperformed the PlayStation 2 in virtually every area, despite being what many viewed an inferior system in terms of raw computing power. So there's no true metric to say which is the most powerful. The most powerful platform is PC. Yep. I guess that's the only one you could really say is the most powerful because home consoles, there's always a design, there's always a bottleneck to any platform that may give another platform an advantage in certain situations, depending on how a game is designed and its vision, its fidelity, its feature set, and so many other things. Then had a $5 donation from The Dark Void. So with the next gen having DLSS, do you think that DLSS be available in handheld mode. I mostly play my Switch in handheld mode, and I am hoping DLSS will be available in portable mode. It's a really good question, and something that I've given some thought to, whether DLSS will only be exclusive to docked mode, because that's really where you want it. I don't know. I mean, part of me does wonder, you know, if they'll just keep it exclusive to, uh, to docked mode. But I think if you do have dlss as a feature 
and you have it pretty much everywhere, right? Like, I mean, if you've got an eight inch display and you've got 1080p, we'll say it's 1080p screen, you still want to get that DLSS. You still want those smooth out frames. You still want things to look good, but we'll see. I mean, it's a, it's an interesting question and I've, I've definitely have tried to give it some thought over the last few months. Mm -hmm. Then had a $3 donation from cyber rider 17. Can we have a petition to shut Spawn Wave with his daily dose of retweeted news? <laughs> also, where the fuck is Silk Song? <laughs> I love your format, Nate. You and MVG are the best in gaming. Well done. Asking the True. real questions over there. Both very good questions. Silk Song, Nate and I were talking about this off, you know, just on on our DMs the other day. I personally, and I don't look. Please, outlets, don't run the story because I'm just making shit up as I go. But <laughs> I think Silk Song doesn't exist. I, I think something's happened to that game. I don't really know what's happening to Silk Song. It's in a cocoon Could waiting be. to Could spring be. to life. Could be. Uh, and their final question was, should we expect a face reveal for the holidays? Probably not. No, no, you should not. I don't think so. Perhaps I am the man with no face. <laughs> Then had a $5 donation from Maria. Hey, Nate and MVG, if the Zelda movie isn't about Ocarina of Time, what game do you think would it be about? And maybe a new original story. Love the podcast and always look forward to a new episode. I hope it's Skyward Sword and someone Why? plays Groos in it. That's not a bad reason, <laughs> actually. Look, and the theme song can come on like yeah. by an orchid do 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 <laughs> this shit writes itself let's go yeah but if they did ocarina of time you could have like the sculpture kids you could horror, yeah. and the creepy hand and stuff that'd be cool that'd be cool but i feel like, I feel like the zelda movies is going to be a, a very surface level safe movie I don't feel like it's going to have that dark Zelda themes that, that were associated with like Majora's Mask and, and Ocarina of Time. I think it's going to be a, you know, it's going to be a, it's going to be like the Mario movie in that sense. Mm. Yeah. I mean, based on what we know so far, the writer, the director, I mean, I don't really have that high of hopes for this movie. I honestly, Nate, I don't really care care for the Zelda movie. It's not something that I feel like I'm probably going to watch. I saw the Mario movie. I thought it was cool. The Zelda movie, I'm kind of lukewarm. I was kind of lukewarm to the announcement. I mean, I knew it was probably the next, you know, the next iteration of their movie uh, making thing that they're doing right now because it makes sense that Zelda is the next movie in, in line. But I just don't feel yeah. that excited about it in general. I'd rather play another Zelda game. Than I mean, there's a lot of questions to be had. Like, is Link going to talk? The safe assumption is, yes, he's going to talk to some capacity. Um, I imagine, yeah, they probably are going to adapt one of the games. I wouldn't be surprised if it's something a little more modern. Maybe something like Twilight Princess. Yeah. Um, like, Skyward Sword would be a smart thing because that is kind of the first true entry to the storyline if you want to go through all that zelda lore mm -hmm. or like a twilight princess you have the evil breaking through i'm actually interested in whether or not the villain route they go do you do the human form as ganondorf or do you introduce ganon mm -hmm. as the giant pig i kind of because yeah because you know like ganon is the pig demon right. that's his true form ganondorf is just his human counterpart mm -hmm. or you go to link to the past and you can bring in the wizard there you go well one day we will see a trailer in what three years maybe <laughs> we'll probably see a trailer next year i would think especially if the, you know if they've been working on this movie for the last four years or whatever they said hey maybe i'll be cast as tingle that'd be cool <laughs> then had a $10 donation from Eagle Vidya. 
Any update on Princess Peach Showtime? Expecting any new footage before early 2024 Direct? Any guest info on if her in-game model will remain unchanged despite the cover art change? Thrilled for her new game? Questions on behalf of me and Peach? Superfan. I don't think we're going to hear anything about Princess Peach until next year. I, there's always the Game Awards, but I don't think so. I mean, Nintendo's usually pretty quiet this time of year. So Yeah, I would say that first Direct of 2024 is when we'll get the next sizable, yeah. meaningful update. As for changing her in-game model, I feel as though the cover art was changed in the same way that Kirby has changed for Western releases where they make Kirby angry for no reason. And it was just more to reflect a little closer to her character model in the movie. So consumers will put those two together, kind of subliminal messaging through marketing on the cover. Be like, hey, that looks familiar. Oh yeah, it's Peach from the movie we saw. So let me pick up this game. That's all about her. I wouldn't be shocked though if her in-game model has been refined a slight bit I don't think it's going to undergo any significant overhaul. Then had a $5 donation from Jackie G. Happy belated birthday to the channel. Thank you. The channel thanks you. How old are we? In our final. uh, We are doing this for a while now, right? Yeah, I think we're like... I mean, we were doing this when like... About three years old. I think before COVID had started or... Right right. around the time COVID started really hitting the industry like it was early 2023 we began wow yeah covered a lot of things we went from weird sean thumbnails (laughs) with little hidden imagery in the thumbnail forgot about that stuff like a very happy skeleton Our final question for this week comes from Aronson, who gave a dollar and writes, Oh, and I forgot to ask, any clarity about what you heard for F-Zero and whether it was supposed to be 99 or GX? Any update about GX? Also, you may be aware of any other remakes or remasters. I know you heard of Fire Emblem Genealogy, but I do not worry about that. Do you know anything about F Zero? I mean, I know there was some talk about GX and and mm-hmm. and stuff like that. We got ninety nine, which is that's a great game. I know you really like it. Any any updates yes. on GX? No update on that matter. Um, I'm still fairly confident that my contacts did not confuse ninety nine for the F Zero that they had relayed to me. My, I guess you would say, my hopeful, optimistic side is that maybe there is a another more ambitious f-zero game that remains in active development and hey maybe we see something relating to f-zero come 2024 again because i feel as though f-zero 99 wasn't just the i don't feel like that was the true revitalization of the franchise it almost seemed as though here's an introduction because we have something bigger still around the corner but i really don't have any clarity on that right now that's just speculation on my part and that is all the Streamlab questions for this week. If you'd like to support the channel, we have a Streamlabs link in the description below. Donate any dollar amount, ask a question. We will answer it at the end of the episode. Donate $100 or more, and we will dedicate the episode to you. And with that, I'd like to thank MVG for joining me as always. Always a pleasure, Nate. Thanks for having me on. Great conversation as always. Yes, it was a very fun conversation. And let us know your thoughts in the comment section below, whether or not you believe the Nintendo denial regarding the Switch 2 being shown at gamescom in any form and your thoughts on the sales of the nintendo switch as well as tears of the kingdom versus breath of the wild in the comment section below as well and until next time continue to embrace the hate